Hello and welcome to Podland, the last word in podcasting news. It's Thursday the 30th of June 2022. I'm Sam Sethi, the MD of River Radio, the podcast first radio station. And I'm Ariel Nissenblatt, Community Manager at Squadcast.fm, founder of Earbuds Podcast Collective and co-host of the Sounds Profitable podcast, standing in for James this week, who is on a much-deserved holiday with his family. And you can tell I didn't write this script because I wouldn't say holiday, I would say vacation. Hey! Ah. (laughs) Hey, I'm Zach. And I'm Brock. And we're from Squadcast. And we're going to be talking today about the new Squadcast studio and backstage update. And I'm Tom Webster, and later I'll be talking about The Creators, the first research project from Sounds Profitable. Hi, I'm Sophie Hind. I'm the Managing Director of VoiceWorks, and we'll be later talking about VoiceWorks and everything we do. I'm Jim Salverson, Head of Sport at VoiceWorks and Head of the Sport Social Podcast Network. We'll be talking about all the work we do within digital sport audio. They will. Podland is sponsored by Buzzsprout, podcast hosting made easy. Last week, 3,167 people started a podcast with Buzzsprout. And now there's Buzzsprout ads to grow your podcast wherever it's hosted. You can find out more at buzzsprout.com forward slash ads. And we're sponsored by Squadcast, the remote recording tool that creators love. This week, Squadcast launched version 5, the new Squadcast studio and backstage with new features and a new look. Last week, 4,311 hours of quality audio and video were recorded using Squadcast. Podland is where Aaron and I this week are going to review the top podcasting stories and interview some of the people making the news. This week's episode is a long one, but the good news is that Podland supports both transcripts and chapters, so please jump to the relevant story or interview that interests you the most. First up, we're going to talk about the launch of Sounds Profitable's new creators study the study is of people who create podcasts in the usa it was done by tom webster and basically the u.s population although it's evenly split between men and women it shows that the creators was quite a diverse population it also said that it was significantly younger and more male was the summary of it most of the people have both an android and or ios device and then one of the other standout facts was more than four in ten podcast creators have been listening to podcasts for under a year there will be a full link to the report in our show notes now ariel did you see any of this live broadcast of the study i saw it live i was ingesting it in real time and then sharing thoughts and slides right on twitter at the Sounds Profitable Twitter handle. So if you want a full breakdown of my thoughts and my analysis, you can check that out at Sounds Prof News. And uh, yeah, a lot stood out to me here, but I think the the most gratifying part was a lot of what Tom laid out for us was statistics that I had thought of or that I had expected anecdotally, that I'd been seeing anecdotally, hearing anecdotally, but to have them backed up by numbers was really gratifying. Yeah, James, obviously, as we've said, is away, but Pod News was a sponsor, which meant James saw the study early and he caught up with Tom Webster from Sounds Profitable. And he started off by asking Tom, what was the thinking behind the research? It did involve a lot of thinking, James, because it's one of the a series of questions that I've been asked most in the last three or four years of my career when I was doing research for Edison. Not a week would go by when I wouldn't get a question from a journalist or someone at Venture Capital wanting to know the stats of people making podcasts. And it's an important question because it reflects on the content, right? It's the input for the output. And it was a question that I was not able to answer satisfactorily until now. So when you were talking about creators, are you just talking about people behind the microphone or what sort of people are you talking about? No, we're really talking about anybody that's involved with the production of a podcast. And that could be on the production side, that it could be sound design, it could be research, booking, or it could be hosting. I think certainly for as many podcasts as there are, and I think it's over 4 million on podcastindex.org, there are at least that many creators and and some multiple of that sort of So you presented the results of the research. What were the three main things? I think one of the things I wrote down as I was watching it was you had an interesting slide around diversity, the diversity of podcast creators in comparison to the US audience. What did you discover there? One of the things that certainly we've noticed in data such as infinite dial data, certainly this year's infinite dial data, is that the podcast listening audience in general is starting to trend towards being more diverse than the U.S. population. 
period. And I actually think it will continue to go that way. And one of the reasons for that, certainly in the past couple of years, we've seen a surge of Latino listeners in the United States. That's something that Edison Research has reported in its U.S. Latino listener study for the past couple of years. And that surge was mirrored or echoed in the creator study. We saw a significant over-indexing of Latino creators. And when we look at the U.S. population in general, U.S. is about 63% white or Caucasian. But with creators, again, could be hosts, could be production, all up and down the chain. That number is 51%. So from, a, from an ethnicity standpoint, the creator population is, in fact, quite diverse. Yeah, and it's not just Latinos, is it? It's people of color, of all types of different color. Yeah, absolutely. The percentages of Black Americans, Asian Americans are all at least as high or higher than they represent in the U.S. population. So again, from that standpoint, it's a very diverse pool. So uh, diversity in terms of race is one thing. Diversity in terms of gender and in terms of education is quite different as well, isn't it? So what did you discover there? Yeah, I think this is really one of the most significant findings in the study. The U.S. population is about 50-50, right? It's at 49% men. So it's a skosh under 50% there. So bad news for ladies night. But the podcast creators are 69% male and 29% female and then 2% non-binary. And that's an enormous difference, right? And the data from which the creator study was pulled was fairly normal looking data. It's pulled from a data set of weekly podcast listeners, which is a slightly more male data set, but only slightly. So this is a significant finding. It's a legitimate finding. And I think it speaks to enabling women at all levels and empowering women and encouraging them to get behind the mic, to get behind the editing console, there has to be more outreach done there and more encouragement. This is research. So obviously it's not necessarily telling you the reasons why it's just reporting on those numbers, but would you have any reason why it's so male dominated? Is it gadgets? Is it technology? Is it that kind of stuff? Or is there something else at play? One of the things you learn as a researcher is that things don't change by themselves. When we're used to seeing a line going up, it doesn't continue to go up or go down unless things continue to make it go up or go down. And you and I both have a radio background, James, from back in the Mesozoic era. And if you go back to the early days of podcasting, a lot of podcasting, certainly the podcast audience back in 2005, 2006, when I first started researching it, the podcast audience was two thirds male. I suspect the creators were 90% male back then. And a lot of that, I think, comes from the gestation of podcasting, which a lot of early podcasters were disgruntled radio employees, right? People that were not finding their voice, were not able to get their show the way they wanted, or we're not getting a show. And so you saw a lot of that in podcast. And I don't know if you've been to an, an American radio conference lately, James, but it's a lot of guys who look like me. Yes. And that's still true in radio. And I, I think that continues to rinse out through podcasting. Yeah, Podcasting has done a very good job attracting a more diverse audience, a broader audience, certainly a nearly gender equal audience. But I think more needs to be done at the various levels of podcast, both to encourage independence, but also to encourage people at the top levels, at the network levels, to get more women involved in the space. Because ultimately, James, I want people to see this as a career, as a valid career. If my son, I have a son who's about to enter his last year of high school. If he says to me, dad, I want to be a podcaster. I don't want that to, to sound weird. I want that to actually be <laughs> a legitimate career. And all of that is down to how it, I think, is positioned as a career, how people are encouraged, the tools and the on-ramps into podcasting, which aren't easy. You're talking about high school. How about education and things like that in terms of podcast creators? Is there a good diversity there? Yeah, I would say not. The podcast creator audience over index is overwhelmingly high for advanced degrees, much, much higher than the U.S. population. If you look at the, at the U.S. population, 42% of the U.S. population is basically high school educated or less. That figure with creators is 12%. And you compare that with advanced degrees, the U.S. population, about 10% has at least some graduate credits. That's 40% with creators. That's a very distinctive slice of American humanity that is quite a bit different from the audience. Yes, the podcast audience does index for higher levels of educational attainment than the U.S. population but not that high. And I think that has a ripple effect in content that has a ripple effect in mindset, ideology. Uh, and I think it all speaks to the fact that even as podcasting continues to grow and be vibrant, it's still in a bubble and it can still break out of that bubble and grow even more. It's interesting talking about podcast creators being overwhelmingly male, overwhelmingly highly educated. 
and then having a look at our backgrounds in terms of the radio industry, where the radio industry has been, as you say, overwhelmingly male, but also overwhelmingly highly educated as well. And I think one of the problems that some broadcasters have in the same way as podcasters have is actually making sure that there are people from every walk of life, making sure that they're making those particular shows because they're also consuming them too. Yeah. And I think that's going to come from schools in a lot of ways. I think equipping schools at the secondary level with the studios and tools for people to find their voice, to find all the ways that they can contribute to getting a message out there. Desires and needs and the urgency for society, frankly, exist at all levels. They exist in rural parts of the United States. They exist in impoverished areas of the United States. And there's too much talent being locked away in those areas and unable to find its voice. And I think whatever the industry can do to empower people at all of the various strata of society in the United States is going to selfishly lock podcasting in as a career and as a vibrant, thriving industry. But it's also important. It's why a lot of us started podcasting in the first place. So this is fascinating data. It's obviously just a year's worth of data. It's just a snapshot's worth of data. Is the plan to do this every year as we go on? Yeah. And I think going forward, the data from which this study was derived comes from Edison podcast metrics, which my understanding is that they're going to dramatically increase the sample size of that, which in turn, we should see a concomitant rise in the sample for the creators. So going forward, I would expect to be able to not only replicate what we've done this year and track it, but also go deeper and talk about black creators, talk about young creators. And then the kind of elephant in the room, the folks that are our age who are not creating podcasts and you and I are, but as you can see from the data, we are, we're rare birds. Encouraging people 45 plus to get their voices out there is a big part of of making the content diverse and appealing for people that are 45, 50 and older. Indeed. And what else is, sounds profitable working on? Is this the only piece of research that you're doing or are you going to be doing more of that? And you're also doing some events as well, aren't you? We are, yeah. No no rest for us. It sounds profitable. We're kicking off really day zero of podcast movement in Dallas in August with the first Sounds Profitable Business Summit, which is an event for sponsors of Sounds Profitable. It's going to be a fairly significant event, we hope. It's going to be the debut of our next research project, really the first and kind of a major quarterly series of studies that we're going to be doing. And our first study there is going to tackle the various executions of podcast advertising, the differences in lift and brand consideration and effectiveness of various types of podcast advertising, which, you know, it's going to be one of the things that we're really focused on. It sounds profitable. It's having lots of sponsors, lots of participation. So these aren't studies that are commissioned by a company about a specific viewpoint. We're here to uncover the truth without bias. And that's something that thankfully we are well equipped to do. Well, if you want to find out more information about the creators, then you can go to soundsprofitable.com. Tom, thank you for your time today. Thank you, James. Tom Webster there. Now, Ariel, one of the standout statistics that surprised me, there weren't many women, it seems, podcasting. There's you, there's Jess Kaufman. There's many other great podcasters that I know of. But as an industry, it doesn't seem that there are many women. Why is that? Yeah, and it's funny because I definitely know a lot of women who create podcasts. But I think Tom brought this up during the Q&A that we had after. And somebody asked a question about the sample size and suggested that maybe we should do this as an exit survey at Podcast Women. And Tom's response was that would probably make it a very biased sample size because those are the people who take podcasting seriously enough to be at a conference, to pay to be at a conference. So just with that in mind, I know a lot of female podcasters. I know a lot of people who identify as women who create podcasts. But why are there not more? Why are there only 29% of creators are women? I think it has a lot to do with what Tom mentioned, which is that podcasting started out very male-dominated and has continued to be very male-dominated. I think James might have suggested that it has a lot to do with tech and how still, even on YouTube, a lot of the people who review tech or who comment on tech or who have tech shows are men. And that's not to say that tech is only for men, but I think there's a longstanding tradition of men being the ones who review tech and who get first access to these new technology, whether it's software or hardware. So I think this is half the battle is being aware. I didn't know this number before. I didn't know 29%. Knowing that lights a fire under my 
butt <laughs> and <laughs> is going to help me try to empower other women. And a lot of people have already taken this screenshot from the presentation and have said, if this is ever an inkling that there is an opportunity for women and for people who identify as women to make shows and to show off any idea that they have in audio form, now is the time. Yeah, I think you're right. I think the barriers to entry are to do more with the difficulty of creating podcasts. You and I probably don't think there is much difficulty because we create so many of them. But I remember three, four, five years ago, oh God, which mic should I buy? Totally. What's the best software platform? And then how do I publish it? Who's the best host? There were so many technical questions to understand even before and then actually getting it distributed onto Apple or Spotify, etc. It's quite a daunting thing. Still. But I think generally speaking, we talk about confidence when it comes to tech. And I bet that more women would identify as hesitant when it comes to technology than men. And that has a lot to do with imposter syndrome. I know that I experience imposter syndrome, so I cannot be the only one. And this is obviously not to speak for all women and all people who identify as women. But I think that if you were to poll a sample size, do you feel comfortable with technology? I bet more men would say yes than women. Yeah. And more younger people than older as well. Yeah. This is probably not the only reason that women are not podcasting. It also has a lot to do with the fact that women are disproportionately impacted by caring for children and don't have as much free time, even though they might be spending more time in the home rather than men. But I think these are all contributing factors. However, education is something that I feel like we can tackle. So this is a call to action for everybody that we might need some more intro to podcasting classes and to demographics that we wouldn't have reached out to beforehand. We'll keep an eye on the study. Look forward to the next one from Sounds Profitable. There's going to be a lot of studies from Sounds Profitable. The next one is going to be at Podcast Movement in Dallas. But Creators, I believe, is going to be annual. Excellent. Now, you have been fairly busy. You've been working on a couple of other things. Now, America, I have to say, has gone slightly mad. Just pointing it out. And we're not talking about the guns this time. Ariel, you write for Pod News as well. And you wrote about the recent US Supreme Court overturning of Roe versus Wade, which you said sank your heart. But you've got a way that you hope us podcasters can fight back a bit. Tell me more. Yeah, I woke up on the day that Roe versus Wade was overturned to the notification because I was on West Coast time. And I was initially taken aback, even though I knew that this was coming, even though the leak happened and we were all prepared, it was still shocking. So my initial reaction was, OK, this sucks. What are we going to do? I felt defeated. And then I don't know what happened, but I pretty quickly was like, OK, what can podcasters do to uniquely react to this in a way that other creators, other people cannot. The creators, we're talking about the creators today. How can the creators react to this? What do we have at our disposal that allows us to offer resources? And it's our platform. And one way to really show up is to do that in a unified way. So I put out a call to action on Twitter and I said, is anybody interested in organizing a massive pre-roll campaign where we write language that is inclusive, that everybody can use on their show? And we offer resources, we offer links, and we offer like essentially a copy and paste that you can put in your show notes. And within 24 hours, we had a statement. And this came together in an effort from many people from all over the world, from all genders, from all races. And I'm really proud. And I knew that we needed to act fast because I knew we would lose the momentum if we didn't have a statement within 24 hours. So I'm really grateful to all of the people who were willing to work with me at 10 p.m. on a Friday night on a Google Doc and we were chatting and we were crying and laughing and really just coming together to make sure that we had this statement. And then Saturday afternoon, we shared that statement on Twitter and I updated everybody by the half day, I would say, mid-afternoon update, afternoon update, evening update. And all of those tweets were really well followed and people were encouraging us along the whole time. And I am really overwhelmed by the response from the podcast community. Big podcasters, small podcasters, famous people, not famous people, men, women, non-binary folks, everybody really stepped up. And I am ready for the backlash, but thankfully I haven't gotten any. So if you're listening to this, just be nice. If you have something to say that is anti what I'm saying. <laughs> Ultimately, I'm a human. The people who are fighting for the right for abortions and for comprehensive access to healthcare, including abortion, we are all people and we just really want people to live and we really want people to be able to have access to this sometimes life-saving 
procedure. Yeah, that's the goal here. Yeah, we have some views over here, which I'll keep to myself. But one of those <laughs> is in the report, it showed very heavily a skew towards Democrats rather than Republicans who create podcasts. And if ever there was a reason for women to get involved in podcasting, maybe this is it, to share their voice and spread the word. Yeah, absolutely. And women can podcast about any anything. It doesn't have to be women's rights issues, but this pre-roll ad campaign allows anybody who wants to step up and say something to say something. And Marcus DePaula helped create podvoices.help, which is a new website where we're going to house language when issues come up around the world that podcasters may want to respond to. And people can go to podvoices.help to get these scripts, to get these links, to get everything. And in theory, we will create language for future issues or good things that happen. You never know. Okay, now let's move on a little bit. Spotify is getting a little bit of beef from Bloomberg, it seems. This week, Spotify's billion-dollar bet on podcasting has yet to pay off, which was the title of a Bloomberg Business Week post this week. The original title was Spotify's Joe Rogan-powered mm. podcast bet hasn't paid off. Where do you think Spotify is going wrong? It's very hard to say because Spotify is pretty ubiquitous among Gen Z. And my sister is of Gen Z. She would laugh if she heard me talking about her like she was a study. But yeah. <laughs> um, Spotify is everywhere. And I also recently was at VidCon in Anaheim. Spotify is everywhere. I recently visited the Spotify offices and they're beautiful. And the team is really jazzed about everything that's going on in the podcast space. So I don't know where this is coming from. And to be honest, my initial reaction is that I'm upset because my thought is when podcasting grows anywhere... Spotify, Apple, it grows all of podcasting. So I want to see Spotify's billion dollar bet pay off. I think it will pay off. I think Daniel X pretty committed to it. I think he understands that the business can't rely on the music side of it. One of the other things in Tom Webster's report was that Spotify is the number one place for consumers now listening to podcasts and the market is beginning to pick up on it and i loved some of the comments in the study on the live stream people were saying they prefer to use platforms like apple and spotify to the standalone apps because they want to jump in and jump out of music and then go back to a podcast and they don't really want to have two apps to do that with. Everything seems to be going in favor of Spotify. It just feels like the Obamas have left and the numbers don't seem to be going back to, I guess, the city and shareholders, which is where the bet's not paying off, showing that there's a massive uplift. Because the share price, I'm sure you're probably aware, Ariel, has dropped massively in the last six months. When I was at VidCon, I got a sense of what the creator landscape on the whole sort of thinks of podcasts. I went to one panel led by Rooster Teeth on podcast creation and how to, quote unquote, break into the podcast industry. And there were questions from the crowd that I had not heard in a really long time because I am so steeped in the podcast space where the baseline is, you know, it's pretty high. People know a lot when it comes to uh, what makes a podcast successful or uh, what microphone to use. But the general creator is under the impression that they can repurpose video for podcasting. And I would suggest otherwise. But my point here is that there are a lot of people out there who don't really understand how people are creating podcasts, how they should be consuming podcasts, and where podcasts might fit into their day. I think that we need to understand listeners more. I have been seeking for five years people who are obsessed with podcasts as much as I am, but people who have no intention of creating podcasts, people who are just listeners through and through. I want to find those people. <laughs> I doubt they listen to this podcast, but if they do, find me. <laughs> I through earbuds, I think I have leaned into people. I've leaned into creators or podcast listeners who eventually become creators. But I'm also very curious about the people who just want to consume. Well, most people who consume TV are never going to make TV. So where are the people who just love podcasts? And I think that's what Spotify needs to focus on. I think a lot of it has to do with education. Like, when can you listen to a podcast? And we need to hit people at the right time with the right podcast so that they are inspired to listen to podcasts 
from then on, when I started listening to podcasts in earnest in 2014, at first I was probably skeptical. I was like, eh, why would I listen to podcasts when I could listen to the radio? Why would I listen to podcasts when I could consume content through reading? But then when I listened to podcasts and it clicked for me, I wanted that feeling over and over again. So we just need to inspire people with the right podcast at the right time so that they get that feeling over and over again. I am such an evangelist. Holy snot. <laughs> yeah. One of the other criticisms Hot Pot Insider is saying that Spotify original Breaking Bread may be its biggest hit yet, but was mysteriously not promoted by Spotify at all. And yet it was number two for much of last week. Yeah. The criticism has been pointed firmly back at Dawn Ostroff uh, that her growth strategy isn't working. I'm a little bit confused by that one, because if it was number two for much of last week, and it may be the biggest hit yet, why would there be criticism? Because it's not being promoted by Spotify. So they're not giving it the big push. But does it need uh, it? Well, again, when you're on the up, maybe you push it even further and get a bigger audience. Mm, it. Interesting. Who knows? Now, they have responded with something new. So Spotify and Anchor have debuted something called Radar for Podcasters. It's a podcast creative version of the Spotify program designed to spotlight emerging voices worldwide. The company starts off by highlighting more than 40 new creators around the world. So look, these are the sorts of things that Spotify does really well, I think. Again, I do think they do a lot of good for the industry. James and I often have some negatives on Spotify, but I do think they do a lot of good as well. I agree. I just wish they'd embrace more of the Podcast Index 2.0 RSS extensions and be more open. You can't have everything. You can call it out and hope that the right people are listening. Now, just on a fun side, what do you like at karaoke? What's that song called? Bust a Move. <laughs> I, I know it all by heart. <laughs> well, Spotify added a karaoke feature to all their mobile devices that builds off lyrics. Which, Genius. Yeah, so now you can sing into your microphone on your iPhone or Android, and it will give you a score or a scale oh out of 100. We're going to have audio, to man. There's some amazing technology out there. That's amazing. <laughs> and one of the other things that they are doing, Chris Messina pointed this out a few weeks back. They are now rolling out the community tab. Basically, I can now see what music oh. you're listening to. They've got a similar feature on the desktop. But sadly, I, and I really think they should have done it. But I don't believe you're going to be able to see what podcasts people are listening to. Well, you can go to Good Pods for that. Now, moving on to Squadcast, something you know very well. The Squadcast launched what they call the all-new Squadcast. The remote recording tool offers simplified pricing, a reimagined design, multi-account access and enhanced security, as well as deeper integration to third parties like Descript. I got to interview Zach and Rock, the loveliest guys in podcasting. <laughs> they told me all about it. As it happens, Ariel, or one of your many hats within this podcasting industry is that you're the community manager over at Squadcast. Tell me a little bit more. Reveal behind the curtains what it's been like to launch version five. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for asking. It's been a journey. We have been working really hard on it behind the scenes. And unlike when we launched V3 back in January of 2021, which was our video, when we enabled the ability to record video, people weren't really asking for this update, this ability to create teams and shows, because it's an extra. But I think it's an extra that will really work hard to amplify collaboration among creators. What it does is it allows people who record multiple podcasts or record with multiple people to streamline their workflow. So I have already added my editor for feedback with earbuds I've already invited him onto my Squadcast account so that he can grab the files and do what he needs with them rather than me downloading them, sending them over via WeTransfer. So this just makes it a lot easier and will make things more streamlined for creators. And just from the community perspective, I'll add that we've been working really hard to make Squadcast the remote recording tool for creators who want to be involved in the larger podcast community. I am a huge advocate for if you want your podcast to succeed, one way to help that along is to be involved, to plug into the podcasting space. So we have multiple blog posts on how to plug into the space. We have a very active Slack channel. We have, if you submit your podcast to Squadcast via squadcast.fm slash share, we'll run a pre-roll on our podcast. We might even drop your podcast episode into our feed. And so my job as the community manager is to figure out 
how people want to be involved with Squadcast beyond just their recording session. So that is all. I'm a listener most of the day to podcasts and to community. And that's my goal. And so we have implemented now automated squad shots where you can just press a button and have a shareable image that you can either use for your own promotion on your website or just blast it out to social media. And if you tag us in it, we want to show it off to the world that you are recording with Squadcast. So those are just some of the things that we've implemented as part of V5. Yeah, what I did last night was actually edited Zach and Rock's interview. I had one click access to Descript. It took the separate tracks, all three tracks for my voice, Zach's voice and Rock's voice, merged that into a sequential file and a composition within Descript. And I was able to start editing straight after that one click access straight into Buzzsprout. Okay. Really neat. Yeah, it worked really well. Amazing. So, thanks, guys. Now, moving on from there, some quick news. James has been busy. He's supposed to be on holiday, but he seems he's updated his podcast market data slides. So they're free. If you need more data slides for any presentation you're doing, head on over to podnews.net and you'll be able to get them there. Next up, Veritonic has announced a $7.5 million Series A funding round. It was led by Lavrock Ventures with additional investment from Progress Ventures, Graycroft, Larere Hippo, and Newark Venture Partners. Yeah, this is a big round of funding, so congratulations. Huge. Yeah, and if you want to know more about it, there's a really good report about it on Sounds Profitable that Brian did recently. Head on over there. The membership platform Steady has launched an integration with Spotify using the open access from Spotify allowing podcasters to sell premium shows on the Spotify platform. They join a number of other companies offering the service. So open Spotify access is the way of getting your subscription-based podcast into Spotify. They will be turning on payment structure where they take 5% of your subscription later this year, I think, or early next. Next up, Chris Messina is catching up with Anchor founder Mike Mignano on Life After Spotify and Web3 in the Media on the Tech Meme Podcast Experience Show today. Yeah, Mike Mignano having left Spotify last week. It'll be interesting to see where he goes next. Now, let me see if you know what this reference to. An iPod, a phone, an internet communicator. An iPod, a phone, an internet communicator. Are you getting it? Do you remember that presentation? I do not. <gasps> because Steve... because I was oh. in high school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what you I was say, busy Carol? that day. <laughs> yeah, I'm old. Okay, I'm old. <laughs> I get it. Yeah, June 29th, 2007, the iPhone was released to the world. Are you an iPhone or an Android person? iPhone. iPhone. Yeah, you're not in the dark ages like James. <laughs> That's good to know. It's good to know. Now, coming towards the end of the show, but one story that I really wanted to cover, I was at the London podcast show and we caught up with Sophie Hind and Jim Salverson from VoiceWorks, a really interesting company up in Manchester. And the people behind Crowd Network were, were responsible for producing the Peter Crouch podcast. They just did a deal with Crowd Network, another Manchester company who came out of the BBC, but they've just done a deal with VoiceWorks. And I really wanted to find out what is VoiceWorks, what's their platform offer in terms of helping podcasters and creators monetize their platform. And also Jim Salveson talked about how they're creating a vertical curated podcast platform purely around sports. Sophie Hind, who and what do you do at VoiceWorks? Um, so I am the managing director and founder of VoiceWorks, and I started the business about three years ago alongside Jim. Jim, hello. Now, I haven't got your surname up on screen. It's Salverson, which no one pronounces, so it's, it's better to ask than to just guess, to be honest with you. Jim, what's your role? Well, I do pretty much whatever Sophie tells me. That's the main job I have. <laughs> but other than that, it's looking after the sports arm of VoiceWorks. So VoiceWorks is split into two parts. One, VoiceWorks Sport, which is taking advantage of the huge opportunity we see within sport, covering audio production, podcasting, voice tech, and a load of other things as well. And the other half is looking at working with brands who aren't within sport. So I look after all the sports content we produce. Now, we met at the London podcast event, which was great this year. Sophie, tell me a little bit more then about how or why you came up with the idea for VoiceWorks. Okay, so 
I've worked in audio for a long time, as everyone in our team has, I think. So I've got, well, about 30 years in media, starting at ITV and then a long time working in radio. So I've worked in commercial, I've worked in operations, I've worked in strategy. And the last nine years before we launched VoiceWorks, I was at Global. And I think I just love audio as we all do. But what really struck me back in sort of 2018 was there was this huge opportunity with audio. I've heard People saying for years, radio's dying or audio's dying or listenership is going to decline because of increased choice. But actually what we were seeing was this explosion in listening, particularly through things like podcasts. But at the same time, I was very excited about what was happening with voice assistants and smart speakers. And the two things seemed to marry really well together for me, you know, producing loads of great audio content that audiences might want, whether that's short form or long form, but also tapping into delivery methods via voice and the way that people are behaving now with smartphones and accessing information or using voice notes more seemed to work really well together. So we saw an opportunity and that's the business that we constructed. What came first, the client or the business? Um, I would say a bit of both, which is probably not the right answer. We're very lucky. I approached Motley, who's the CEO of Communicore UK, who I think you know, large commercial radio group and Communicore were very interested in developing new enterprises at the time. So they are our main backer, which put us in a really great position to have the luxury of being a startup, but with the backing of a big group that can provide some central services, but also allow us to tap into expertise. And one of the things that allowed us to have immediately was kind of large sales team around the country. So the Communicore teams can sell product content on our behalf. We also have our own salespeople in-house. So we started very early working with clients and producing things like branded content and podcasts. But we also wanted to do some serious proof of concept, which is where Jim came in. And we met Jim and brought Jim into the business because he'd been doing some work in the voice tech area as well. And we wanted to create our own Alexa skill, Google Action, and start really testing the voice tech space and developing our own brand, Sports Social, which Jim can probably tell you more about. Yeah, Jim, do tell us more. Well, I guess the headline of what we do within sports is that we want sports brands and sports organisations to engage more deeply with the fans and reach new audiences and everything we do comes back to that. And that's where we started pretty much as well. So as Sophie suggested, I've always had an interest. I've worked in radio and audio pretty much my entire career and throughout that entire career, I've always been looking at the next thing, be that podcasting and I released my first podcast I was looking at the date earlier 2005 I released my very first podcast so I've been at that game a long time yeah Yeah. it was in the days of radio where a podcast in terms of what radio were doing with it was just taking a radio show cutting out the music and sticking it on whatever the platform was at the time and Apple I guess was the only thing that you were distributing via but that's another story but yeah I found myself getting involved in voice tech and when I came to work with Sophie and the team at VoiceWorks the first big project was looking to engage sports audience via voice technology. And we were creating a football-focused radio show and a football-focused podcast at that time. And we wanted to try and see whether we could capture a similar audience via voice tech. And we went into partnership with the guys at Amazon in terms of providing them with a really rich daily football update focused on the Premier League. So the vision was every day a football fan, no matter who you supported in the Premier League, would be able to turn to their small round device in the corner of the room, whose name I won't say because I'll start setting off everyone's device. Madam A. Madam Madam A. A. Yeah, good term. And they could say, what's the latest news on Manchester United? What's the latest news on Manchester City, Burnley, Aston Villa, whoever it was? And what they'd get in response to that wouldn't be the kind of response we're used to getting from these devices in that it's a Wikipedia page that opens up, it's text to speak, it's really horrible and not engaging. They'd get an actual human voice, they get something that was engaging, that had one of the most important things about sport content, it had passion within it and it had human connection and they'd be able to have that as the result. So it was taking what we'd learned from the radio world and the world of podcasting and what we know about communicating with audiences and putting it into this voice technology space. And yeah, that was the starting point for what we went on and developed from there. So I'm looking through your slate, Sophie and Jim, and a lot of it is 
branded stuff for other people. Will you evolve into your own IP as well? Definitely. We have some originals already. So Football Social Daily is a show that a podcast that, you know, has been very successful for us. We have some joint IP deals coming up. One that I can't quite release yet, but will be released later in the summer, Sam. And I'm sure you'll be one of the first people we talk to, but we've got a joint IP deal with a global rights holder, which is really exciting for us, helping them develop their audio strategy. So we have a pretty flexible model, depending you know, what what works for us and also what works for the clients. Yeah, we might work in a pay us for our services model. We might work on a joint IP model. We do create originals and we also do revenue funded models as well for rights holders. So depending on their budget situation, we can create their strategy and their content, but we can also find commercial partners to help fund that project. Now, you've recently done a deal with another Manchester based production house called Crowd Network. Can you tell me more about that? Yeah, so our head office is in Manchester, as is Crowd Network, and we've been admirers of the work they do. Got to meet Mike, their CEO, and we felt like our values were very aligned in terms of what both businesses are trying to do in terms of creating great audio with the listener at the heart of that. And so the arrangement we have with Crowd is they own the content and the IP. It's very much their content, but we host it on our Sports Social Podcast Network which we launched last year. So we provide the distribution, we provide some marketing support, and we also provide the monetization strategy for them, which allows them the space to concentrate on the content and the new originals that they want to produce. So Jim, I'm assuming that's something that you're heading up, that sports social network. How many podcasts run through that and what's the plans going forward for it then? Currently we've got Ooh, around 150 podcasts wow. at this particular time, but by the time someone listens to this, hopefully it will be more because we're growing pretty rapidly at the moment of varying sizes. That's after just over a year of development and growth. I mean, our plan is to be the biggest single destination for sports audio in the world at some point over the next couple of years, and we're well on the route to doing that. And partnerships with people like the Crowd Network are certainly helping us achieve that in terms of not just title numbers, but also audience size. But I think our unique offering in terms of what we're providing our partner podcasts with is it's a combination of what Sophie's talking about. We are content creators at the end of the day, but there are a lot of people who create good podcasts and understand content. I think the unique part of our business and what we have as a team is we all have this commercial radio or in Sophie's case, a bit of commercial TV background as well an understanding of how to make things profitable and to make things certainly wash their face so we can bring that into the creative world i mean i love coming up with ideas and i love getting deep into concepts and getting going away with the fairies as all creatives do but at the same time we have an understanding that things have to have a bottom line and things have to make sense from a business proposition as well so i think we, we came to the sports social podcast network idea as a result of feeling the frustrations as creators and looking to resolve those frustrations in some way. We have been making podcasts for, like I said earlier, I've been making podcasts for 17 years or so. And the two main frustrations have always remained the same through that period. One is discoverability and one is monetization. They're both real problems for most people within the podcasting world. We're not going to solve either of those overnight, but we are making steps to resolve both of them as well. From a discoverability point of view, we wanted to create a hub where people could discover great sport content, a focused library of content, which we've done, and it's now about raising awareness of where people can find that content. And from a monetization point of view, we wanted to open the options to people who didn't have upwards of 10,000 listeners and offer ways that people could make money from their podcast, no matter what their audience is. If you've got a tiny audience, you're not going to make huge money off it. That's the fact of it. But we wanted to give people the options within that to pull those levers. And part of that is by opening up the different monetization channels to these podcasts. But part of it is also making sure people are making the most of their content from a revenue point of view. And we think sport is a industry that commands high revenue across many other mediums from print to television, but doesn't always command that in podcasting. So we wanted to redress that balance slightly and may, and see if we could push the kind of revenue and CPMs that sport podcasts get to where they are across other mediums. But at the same time, 
There's a bit of an issue with the way podcasts are sold and the way advertising campaigns within podcasts are sold that means no one's winning necessarily. The podcasters aren't creating the right content, the podcasters aren't getting the right revenue and the advertisers aren't winning because podcasting is not being sold in the way that we know audio advertising works from our radio backgrounds. So we know audio advertising works from long integrated campaigns where audiences really buy into the content and buy into what the presenters are saying. That's audio superpower, right? It's the connection between listener and presenter. And at the moment, podcast advertising isn't necessarily sold in that way. It's sold in spot ads. It's sold in one-off reads for the likes of male shaving products or flashy mattresses or whatever we've all heard a million times on various (laughs) podcasts. So that's what our vision is. There's a certain element of what we're doing now in terms of we are offering marketing, we are offering monetization to our partners, but at the same time, there's what we want to achieve in the future. And that is fundamentally changing the model a little bit in terms of how podcasts are monetized. So just so everyone knows, what is the URL for the hub where they can go? So you're best off just searching, to be honest with you. I think that's the easiest way to do it. So if you get into your Google or whatever it is, Sports Social Podcast Network is the thing to search and it comes up. Cool. Now, given that you've got a sports vertical, are you going to go and open up other verticals? Good question. Not yet. <laughs> Sophie's the on the spot. No, it's I, fine. I love how uh, Jim just looked at Sophie and went, <laughs> yours to answer that one. <laughs> the answer is not yet. We've got a very aggressive roadmap, a very clear business plan and big ambition in sport. And it dovetails nicely with the sport production and rights holder side of our business. So the two work hand in hand. So in terms of our growth ambition, as Jim said, we've done incredibly well in, in 12 months and we're continuing to grow every week. We've got download targets and revenue targets and we are ahead of where we intended to be, which is really exciting. And we're going to smash those this year. But our growth strategy is to move into new markets from next year and develop the Sports Social Podcast Network. We're already working with podcasts that are hosted outside the UK, but we feel that we can take this to a global model and also develop other audio products within the network, so things like potentially audio news and short-form audio as well. So there's a long way to go in sport for us at the moment. We're recruiting, we're expanding the team rapidly, so we're about to put two new roles live, which is really exciting for us because we we need to make sure we capitalise on this opportunity. And, And then we will consider other verticals. We're already being approached by some of our partners production partners because they do also produce outside of sport so yeah it may come quicker than i've said but we've got we've got plenty to keep us occupied at the moment so tell me how do you go about defining what to add to your network what's the criteria you said it's not they don't have to have the ten thousand barrier that ACAS tends to stick in place. So how do you do it is it you come up with a great content idea jim and then take it to sophie or is it you go actually this celebrity will make a brilliant podcast what's the thinking? There's loads of different routes depending on what product it is we're creating and what it is we're adding to the roster. Obviously, with the podcast network, a lot of that is other podcasters' IP. They maybe already make a show that they host via another platform and they just want to take advantage of the monetization and the the marketing channels that we offer. And in terms of what our criteria is for joining the network, we're pretty much an open platform as long as the podcasts that are being created are advertiser safe, pretty much. As long as they're not misogynistic or sexist Mm -hmm. or homophobic, then actually... So no Joe Rogan then? (laughs) Maybe not on this occasion. Yeah, so that's pretty, pretty open. As long as they're happy to engage in a conversation with us, then we're happy to engage in a conversation with them and see if we can make it work for both parties because that's an important part. It's a two way thing. It has to work for everyone. In terms of original content, then it is, as with most podcasts, it starts with a good idea. And like I say, we always have a slight eye on the bottom line and whether we feel we can build an audience that will allow that podcast to develop and provide us with a revenue stream or the hosts involved with a revenue stream because it is important for the life of the podcast there's no point in doing a podcast for 10 episodes and then the host suddenly going right when do I get paid I don't want to do this with another without x amount going into my pocket and the podcast dies we see that a lot you mean pod fade I think is 
Yep. Three episodes on average or something a podcast lasts. We don't want to be in that scenario. We don't want to invest time and money in something that doesn't exist. But then from the point of view of content that we work with on a rights holder or a brand perspective, that is very much a two-way conversation. It's not just we'll make you a podcast. It's an end-to-end audio strategy. So we sit down with these individuals and we'll talk to them about what they want to achieve. Do they want to achieve better audience engagement? Do they want to achieve another revenue stream for their business? Do they want to create more advertising inventory? Whatever it is they want to do, we will try and create a product and that might be podcasting, it might be audio branding, it might be voice tech that ticks those boxes. So yeah, it's a myriad of different solutions for a myriad of different, I was going to say problems, opportunities is the right word, isn't it? But it's a hundred percent, it's a bespoke service for everyone that we engage with, I think. Yeah. And we talk to agents a lot who represent talent. We talk to talent direct who are looking to get in the space. As Jim said, we initially we did have a target list of existing podcasts that we wanted to get on our network. And we've been very happy that we've been able to achieve that. It's a huge universe. There's still many more that we're in conversation with. So it is a mixed model, really. But as Jim said, the platform is open to anyone, really, with Sports Audio. Now, I assume advertising agencies are waking up to the idea of reaching these target audiences. It has taken them a long time. They're not the fastest moving snails in the park, are they? It's traditional and then they've moved into Are you finding that the conversations are now quicker and easier with those guys? They understand the verticalization of the podcast audience. Yes, I would say so. But I think there's still a way to go in the sense that a lot of the revenue that's coming into podcasting probably sits with the buying teams and trading teams more than the kind of strategy and planning teams. With the sort of traditional media agencies, there's lots of opportunity and incoming briefs. And what we are finding is because our audience is 92% male and young, we've got a very attractive, hard to reach audience that's difficult to buy into elsewhere. So for the right brands, it's an amazing opportunity. Mm. But where we are trying to change the model is working more with strategic planners and thinking about these integrated partnerships that Jim was describing and getting audio on the agenda earlier. We also work with sports specialist marketing agencies as well, because obviously there's lots and lots of brands and rights holders there that haven't entered this space. So we're trying to broaden the approach and also change the way the market thinks. Now, you both come, as you said, from a radio background, and you said you started out in 2018. Sleeping giants, they may be, but they are giants. You've got Global and Bauer. Global recently bought Captivate up in Manchester. Again, it seems like Manchester's a hot bed of podcasting in the UK at the moment. Um, Captivate would not be happy about you just telling them they're up in Manchester. They're in, no, I think they're based in Huddersfield, I think, which is... Anything north of Watford, <laughs> they've stirred, they've woken up. I think they're beginning to understand the opportunity of podcasting as well. Do you see the radio stations becoming a threat or a partner to you now going forward? I don't see them as a threat. Say our parent company is a radio business and you're right, all radio and audio businesses are, are in this space. I think there's room... And that's partly why we're specialising in sport, because we just want to completely own that space and do that extremely well. But for radio brands and for talent, yeah, Global's doing an awful lot in the podcasting space, both with the radio shows and brands, but also with original talent. But I think having one particular sector that you're focused on is the right strategy for us at the moment. I think we, we cool. both worked from Global for Global at various points in our careers. And I think the one thing that Global do get every single time pretty much is brands. And that is a great opportunity for them to build brand extensions via podcasting. And they are doing that to a certain extent at the moment. I think they've done it pretty successfully with Radio X and some of the brand extensions that come out of there in the podcasting world. And that, that will give them a huge, a, a, a huge advantage in the podcasting space because it's a marketing channel as well. In terms of competitors of us, they don't have a sports brand, which I'm probably slightly grateful for at the moment, but I think they will get podcasting right. Now, the BBC is up in your part of the world as well, quite strong. I've renamed the BBC Bye Bye Creators because they're losing every creator that I know. Again, what do you see? Why are people leaving the BBC? And we've seen Emily Maitlis and we've seen John Sopel go. Is this a trend, just given your radio background, maybe less than your voice works? I just thought, is this a trend? Is the day of the BBC and its distribution arm going? Because now you can go what I call director fan. 
Jim will probably have a different answer to me, actually, but we, we've got quite a few people in the VoiceWorks team that are ex-BBC as well as ex-commercial radio. And I should say we're a, a supplier to the BBC, so we do our sort of mostly in the non-sport part of VoiceWorks. We do produce some shows and we've done work for the World Service and Radio 4. So we're not a, a regular supplier, but we do. They, I think their strategy is very much to contract out a lot of the creative thinking and also mm-hmm. production to indies like ourselves. Which yeah. is probably a good thing to do as well. Yeah, I think we, we see that migration. I I'm wouldn't not sure it's an exodus yet, but it might be a migration from the BBC to other platforms. For me, it's two reasons. One, it's financial. The BBC is being squeezed, whereas the commercial market is expanding. And if an LBC, for example, can put a bigger check on the table for some of the BBC's leading talent, then the talent is going to go to LBC. But I also think it's a growing reputation for the platforms that are on offer and a freedom that those platforms offer as well. So I think Mm -hmm. you mentioned Joe Rogan earlier. That's the perfect example that there is money available now within the likes of Spotify, for example, to attract big talent. And although Joe Rogan didn't come from a radio background, he came from a independent podcasting into a podcasting background. There's no reason why we're not going to see in the future podcasting giants be able to attract names from traditional media because it is growing in reputation and it provides an element of freedom that those individuals don't get within the BBC. A good example of it, although it's from a few years ago, would be James O'Brien when he was hosting Newsnight on the BBC. And he was a brilliant host of Newsnight, and I'm sure he was well compensated for his work on that. But he felt he didn't get the freedom as a BBC presenter to provide the political views that he wanted to provide that he could have within LBC. So he made that migration away from television, back onto the radio. Now, that's not a podcasting example, but I think that will happen more and more, but with migrations away from the traditional TV radio into the kind of podcasting spaces so yeah i think it comes down to money and creative freedom and i think andrew moore raised the same yeah, rationale very yeah. recently as well didn't he? i think freedom and i've seen james o'brien talking about his podcast in the last couple of years as well and that's another stage from the radio show yeah. isn't it you've got probably another level of freedom you've also got more time and space in a podcast to expand on some of the stuff you want to talk about yeah, Andrew Marr, I think, said he went down to the BBC vaults to go and get his opinion back. Now, a couple of last questions. Your background, Sophie, is TV as well. Where does video fit in? We've got YouTube uh, and potentially a lot of uh, rumours of video being a big platform play. Where do you see video within VoiceWorks? How's that maybe going to play out for you guys? Yeah, great question. It's a very pertinent question at the moment, and it's something that we're developing our strategy on. As we speak, yeah, you're right. There's a pure audio play and there's multiple schools of thought. Some people believe that podcasts should be audio only. Some people believe they should be YouTube, but some people believe they should be a hybrid of both. And we spend quite a lot of time advising our clients on the right way to approach that. But there is no doubt we are being approached more and more. We do produce some video now when we create content for our clients. And we so we have the capability to do it. But in terms of Sports Social as a platform and the video offering within that will be a part of our play going forward because it's definitely a growing part of the market at the moment. The commercialisation and the interactivity I I get both work well in audio or video, but audio is a a lean back experience and video is a lean forward experience. So they are a very different way of consuming potentially the same content. But moving forward, last question then really, you've built a brand network around bringing in advertisers and giving your background. But there's also there's another trend that's going through the market, which is subscription. Where do you see subscription in the mix of what you do for revenue, for monetization? I think it's a really strong part of how podcasters can monetize their content going forward. And I don't think anyone's got it right quite yet. I think it has to be more than just a ad-free experience. I think it has to be a greater level of content, a greater depth of content that's being offered, and not necessarily audio content as well. I think one of the big powers that subscription has, which maybe a few people have woken up to, but not too many, is allowing people access to a community within that podcast rather than just a different audio experience. Because we know podcasting and we know audio creates communities really well. 
So how can those communities be leveraged via almost... The Crowd Network do this really actually with shows like the Geraint Thomas Cycling Club where they've built a community, a world around their podcasting and that's enabled them to leverage that via merchandise, for example. So I think that is probably the play for premium content within podcasting is not just offering audio but offering access to the hosts, chat rooms, merchandise, group events, that kind of thing, that kind of real added experiential value. I completely agree. And I think, Sam, at the moment, for a lot of producers, the challenge is they're having to access all these different things through different platforms, different models. It's quite labour intensive. The advertising model for YouTube is very different and the CPMs are very different. So I would like to see us develop a solution and that's you know, what we're working on, which gives that whole service in one place and makes it a lot easier for the producer, but also clearly delivers the right amount of revenue. Yeah, I think from everything you've told me, curating a platform around a specific vertical and you want to provide monetization strategies to brands and creators, but at the same time create experiential at the end. It's interesting because the last part of this is, of course, live. And where does live fit into all of this? Because there's two elements to that. One is, obviously, there is in the podcast index, there's a new thing called the live tag. So you can literally tell your subscribed listener that you're now going live and do a live show and then have that sort of interactivity, aka radio. And, and the second part of that is we're seeing sellout shows I me mean, i can't believe my 22 year old daughter's just bought for 2023 parenting hell live and it's sold out already mm. so where does live fit into your plans we have the capability already to put on events and we're in conversation with quite a number of our our producers at the moment about helping some already do it themselves some if they're tied to big agencies or agents have that capability you'll see shows on our le- our network doing lots of live which may be facilitated by us or it may be facilitated by their agents. But you're right, it's a huge space, absolutely huge space. And I think there's far more opportunity there. So us as a business, we offer the ability for events, for merchandising. We are, as you say, we're creating that platform. But I also think there's a further opportunity, which again is something that we want to offer via new platforms that we're developing right now, which is to have live streaming. It's going to be a part of our rights holder offering as well in the future. And Jim, I don't know if you've got anything to add on live. Yeah, it's a particularly pertinent question with regards to sport in terms of live audio content, because we've all consumed sport via the radio at some point, but the breadth of sport can't possibly be covered by the traditional radio provider. So there has to be a digital offering that kind of supports that. And I think there's going to be... (laughs) Traditionally, I think rights holders are used to selling their rights to the highest bidder, whoever that might be, it the EFL selling their commentary rights to one platform or be it BBC buying individual local radio football rights, whatever it is, they're used to selling them away. But I think there's a real power in rights holders being able to take control of those broadcast rights themselves and distribute via their own channels because that opens up again the relationships they have that exist with sponsors there's potentially more value there than there is that they get from a bbc or an itv or whatever it is was looking for the broadcast rights so i think it's a huge part it's not podcasting it's the digital audio space so the, the, there's a huge part to be played there and discussions that we're having with rights holders certainly involve that appetite and a solution for that problem at the moment The issue then comes with distribution because there isn't a place currently that you can go to get live audio commentary from a variety of sports. So there is a challenge there with distribution, but certainly I think there's an an appetite and an opportunity together. A great example is a big sporting event that we're doing later this year. We're working with the rights holder and as part of the audio strategy that we've developed for them, there's podcasting, there's going to be three live podcast events within the big sporting event. Mm. There's going to be short form audio descriptors that are triggered by QR codes to help describe what's going on to the fans. So we try and come up with multi-layered solutions when we're working on those kind of projects. And I think there's a recognition from lots of the rights holders we're talking to that live should definitely be part of their fan engagement strategy. 
Jim, Sophie, wow, you've got your hands full. Amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on to Podland. Remind everyone very quickly, Sophie, where they can go and find out more about VoiceWorks. So voiceworksport.com and voiceworks.ai are the two URLs. And thank you very much for having us, Sam. It's been great talking to you. And I love your passion for audio and radio and podcasting and everything. Sophie and Jim, if you want to know more about VoiceWorks, which I think is a really interesting company, check them out. It's voiceworks.ai. Next up, our On The Move section of the show. At NPR, Yolanda Sangweni has been promoted to VP of Programming and New Content Development. She joined NPR in 2020 after a stint at Luminary. Good luck to her on that new role. Now, one of the interesting jobs that you can find on podjobs.net, which is James's site, is a job for a podcast and talk content strategist. I just put that in there because I reckon, Ariel, you would be brilliant at that job, but it happens to be in Singapore. You never know. I could always move to Singapore, (laughs) especially after the news lately. And I'll just add that I talked a little bit ago about how I encourage folks when they enter the podcast space to fully immerse themselves to plug into podcasting. And one of the resources that I share with them is that they should check out podjobs.net and pretty much everything that James puts out, because that's a really great way to know what's going on in the space, what jobs are available. And yeah, huge fan of all those resources. Yeah, James works really hard, which is why he needs a holiday. (laughs) Now, no Boost Scram Corner either, because he's got all the boosts on his box, and I haven't turned mine on yet. I don't even know what that is, so we're good to go. Which bit don't you know? What, the boxes or Boost Boostagram. I know people talk about it, but I don't think the average person knows about Boostagrams. Look, I'm down to be the uh, the person who stands in for the average listener. (laughs) I think a little bit more than that. Now, look, one of the things that's missing, I certainly believe, within the podcasting world is interactivity from the user side often podcasts feel to me like a one-way communication stream let me put my podcast and my voice out there you consume and ingest it but there is no way as the listener for you to tell me what you think about it unless you go to twitter or you go to some discord server somewhere boostergrams are part of the podcast index 2.0 extensions the idea of having comments that you can give back to creators but with a little bit of payment as well. So a millionth, I think, of a Bitcoin is a sat, and you can use that with your comments. So basically, you're paying to make a comment. It cuts out spam, trolling quite a bit. It just means that you can get a little bit of value for value back to the creator from the listener, saying, hey, great job there, Ariel. Love that podcast. Thank you. And here's my little comment at this point. That tells you what I thought of it. And that's what a boostergram is. Thank you for the boost. Yes, exactly. <laughs> now, Kevin Rook on Twitter has said there are now over 8,000 podcasts on the Lightning Network, which is used to create these boostergrams or, or distribute them. And there's a thousand Lightning enabled shows were added in June alone. It's growing. It's called Value for Value. It came from Adam Curry and Dave Jones, the Pod Father and the Pod Sage. And yeah, I'm hoping that more and more people catch on with it. Uh, and understand that it's a great way of valuing what creators do so, uh, with a little bit of sats. I guess we did have Boostergram Corner after all. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Boostergram Explainer Corner. Moving on to Event Corner, the British Podcast Awards are coming up, organised by Matt Deegan and colleagues, and it's on Saturday the 23rd of July over in Kennington Park in London. Tickets have gone on sale, I've got mine, so if you're going there, please come by, say hello. Be lovely to see you and catch up in person. Next up, there is Podfest Berlin, which is taking place on July 16th in Berlin, Germany. And fun fact, Daniel Stern, the organizer of Podfest Berlin, curated a list for Earbuds Podcast Collective last year in October. So you can check that out. He chose German podcasts. Are you going to Podcast Movement coming up in Dallas in August? Would not miss it for the world, Sam. I'm afraid I am missing it for the world. <laughs> Gutted I haven't gone to podcast movement in LA, but I have a family and they are demanding my time in Italy. So Ooh, I'll be there. You're going on holiday. I am, yes. I'm <laughs> taking a vacation. Oh, yes. <laughs> and last up is Hot Pod Summit in November in LA. Is that one that you go to as well, Ariel? That's a good question. Usually Hot Pod Summit takes place in New York in February surrounding the On Air Fest. And this is, I believe, maybe the second time that Hot Pod Summit is going to be in Los Angeles. I live in New York, but I am willing to travel. So 
Keep me on your invite list, folks. If you want to find out about any more events going on in the industry, check out pod.events again. Thanks, James, for doing all that hard work. So, Sam, what is happening for you this week in Podland? As I said earlier, I've got my tickets for the British Podcast Awards. I'm looking forward to seeing a lot of friends and meeting a lot of new people there. After the London podcast event, I think the British podcast scene is feeling rather chipper, as they say, over this side of the water. And I think there's going to be a real good vibe at this event. So if you haven't got your tickets already, I highly recommend it. And strangely, next week I was invited... It doesn't mean I'll get an award, but I was invited to the Asian Top 100 in Tech Awards. So Look at you. I will be sat at a table somewhere, quaffing a glass of red wine with my fingers crossed, and I'll let you know what happens in a week's time. Ariel, so what else is happening for you in Podland this week? Oh, so much, Sam. First, I'm going to Spain next week, and I've already set up a bunch of meetings with podcast industry folks in Barcelona and in Madrid, and I'm pumped. And if you are there and would like to get a coffee, I would love to do that. I am very interested in exploring and learning about the podcast industry and audio and radio outside of the U.S. So keep me in the loop, folks. And then other than that, just really working on rolling out Squadcasts V5 to the world and letting people know about all the new awesome features we have. And then in Earbuds Land, this week's theme is about Alzheimer's and brain health and caregivers so that's a really important theme and just wanted to shout that out now do you know the boys at rss.com oh i sure do they're based in barcelona yes i already have a meeting with alberto ah the lovely alberto (laughs) yes it'll be a lovely glass of some spanish rioja i'm sure that he'll treat you to (laughs) and that's it for this week if you like podland tell others to visit tell your friends on twitter linkedin facebook or wherever you can also email us at comments at podland.news or send us a boostergram now you know what one is. Yay. You can also find all of our previous shows and interviews on our website, podland.news. If you want daily news, you should get Pod News. The newsletter is free at podnews.net. The podcast can be found in your podcast app. All the stories we've discussed on Podland today are in the show notes and we use chapters and transcripts too. Our music is from Ignite Jingles and we're hosted and sponsored by our good friends, Buzz Sprout, and we record with Squadcast. Keep boosting. Now you know what it is. <laughs> <laughs>